appreciate the great background, Jane. I did appreciate the, the plants and such from the other presentation. So thank you for that. Yeah, um, I was inspired by your uh, video of your student building a raise, uh, creating a garden. So. Yeah. So um, I'm going to go through just for about 10 minutes or so, just imagining some things to think about. So the way I'm perceiving this right now is that we we're getting to know each other. And this is working out, for me, this is working out and wondering about practice with peers. I get to do this somewhat with my own peers at UCSC, but we're always so busy and we're out in the field. And this is another time for us to do this. And so my portion is going to be about just being a little provocative, thinking about some things about supervision that we might carry forward. Because one of the things that's a promise about this project and this conference is that our conversations will move forward too. So I'm going to be talking about reimagining re our teaching as supervisors and reimagining our mentorship as supervisors. And some of the things we'll talk about, I'll share, just thinking about choice in UDL, focusing on development, anti-racist pedagogy, anticipating the future, thinking about mentorship in terms of communities of practice, rehearsals, assessment, evaluation, and what I call the long conversation I shared that with some folks yesterday. So I'm going to move through this very purposefully, and we'll have time later to talk about things. So the first thing I want to start with is um, thinking about UDL. It's come up in a number of our sessions already. Um, a handful of years ago, I'm working with student teachers, and UDL is all new to me. Okay, so I'm learning how to talk about UDL with my student teachers, but all along the way, I'm imagining how do I incorporate those practices in my own teaching. So uh, in my program, I supervise and I also teach um, Practical, practical courses and seminars and such too. So I have to think about it as well. So a thought to put out there is how do we incorporate these understandings of, in understandings into teaching our student teachers? If we're asking them to think about the differences out in the field of their students and how to respond to those in positive, productive ways, how do we do the same for our own work with our student teachers? Um, something I've been wrestling with over the years is just, you know, I don't, believe there's a cookie cutter notion of what a teacher should be. I know my student teachers come in to us in all the different ways and all their different experiences around teaching and learning. And then I also have to imagine and value that they're going to go out into the field as good teachers, but not all the same good teachers. So how do we think about that in our teaching? Um, so the other part that I'm drawing from UDL as well is just how do we incorporate choice in the way we interact with our students? Why do they all have to do the same kinds of assignments, the same reflection tool, the same uh, kinds of lesson planning? How do we think about that a little differently as well? And the other piece that comes out of UDL for me also is representations of learning. We have them do formal observations in very particular ways and they all tend to do it the same way. Are there other ways they might represent their teaching to us? Other ways they might suggest to us how, to, how they want to represent their um, their teaching. And I'm drawing on this from UDL because there's a piece of UDL, and I'm not going to phrase this right. Somebody else more expert in UDL can help with this. A lot about UDL is about self-efficacy, about self-agency. So instead of um, our student teachers moving through the program trying to prove to us that they're becoming good teachers, how do they get to be part of that and agents in proving to themselves the validity of their own teaching? So um, Another thing about reimagining our teaching, I want to help, I want us to think about, and I've been working on this with my peers at UCSC, about reimagining re what counts. Um, and I'm a bit of an iconoclast, so that's just the way it is. Um, a lot of our work is around satisfying program and state requirements. We have those. But what if we've got back to the heart of who we are, which is teachers? What's our good teaching? What's the thing that we do as teachers to move somebody to a better place? And so one of the things that we've thought about in our program is thinking about um, the work we do with our student teachers as not the movement through completing requirements, but moving students along a developmental continuum and thinking about formative work as the heart of what we do as supervisors. So this is something we put together at UCSC. We're in the, we're in the process of redesigning it as well. But the idea was to look across the year of of student teaching. And so we have this, you can see the TPEs are on the left-hand side and we're moving through them quarter after quarter with the understanding that you can be a beginner and you can be moving towards more expertise. Um, I think that's one of the, the problems we might have with the TPEs is they're static that way. 
if you think about if we think about it in terms of develop, development, then we have to understand them a little differently, and maybe that would shift our supervision a bit as well. I'm stealing this. This was my version of Tyrone Howard's dual tsunamis. If you want to know the trick, I put one picture of a of a wave here, and I put the same picture and flipped it. So if you ever need to do double tsunamis, that's how you do it. Um, but then taking from Tyrone Howard, and then I've been following a lot about um, um, you know, abolitionist te teaching as well. How do those things, how do we think about those things as shaping the work we might be doing with our student teachers? Um, and the other part, and this is in response to COVID as well, um, I know with my peers, we're talking about all the things we think about teaching in schools they're up for grabs and sometimes there's going to be some shifts over the next few years and that we have to be in a position to anticipate those. So even for us in our program and some of you I know are having this as well, we're having our last year's grads being pulled into learning pod, pod teaching. We didn't expect that. What, what does that mean for our supervision, our developing them as teachers? So lots of things we have to think about in the future as well. Um, so I want to talk about reimagining our mentoring and this is really close to my heart. There's things that we're trying out. I'm going to say that at UCSC, we're working some things out. And this is something I shared in a session earlier. And I don't, I'm, I'm borrowing this from lots of other people. So this isn't like our ideas at UCSC. Um, in our supervision and our mentoring, we often think about work starting in dyads. So it's often the teacher pair. It's the, it's the supervisor, student, teacher pair, like on the left here. And I've been doing this work for years. And I understand that. There's a really close relationship we have with our student teachers and we're the mentor, we get that. That's, there's a valuable thing to that. But what I wanna propose is we start thinking about a community of practice model, meaning that there's more, there are other knowledgeable others and we know about our CTs. We know about that as a triad, but what if we even push that a little further? So I've heard talk from other sites and Jane may be talking about this as well, just this idea of we think about constellations of people who are supporting each other in this work. So at UCSC, we're going to be experimenting with the multiples about having knots of teachers at schools who might cross boundaries even with their CTs. And also that our supervisors, we're, we're gonna be trying this out, that every student teacher has a primary, primary supervisor, but also a secondary supervisor that sometimes does observations and sometimes conferences. And we're also imagining, especially in COVID, where um, when we have observation conferences, it might be two supervisors, it might be CTs involved in those, and it might be peers involved in observation conferences as well. So this idea of learning together, so it's sort of like this picture on the left. So this is something we're thinking about, we wanna try it out, just a different notion of how we might learn together. Um, I'm stealing this from um, Ellen Kazame and others. Some of, this came up in a talk, um, Frank, I'm sorry, where he's, he's from UCLA, he's a music educator, he's talking about having students talk through their teaching as a kind of rehearsal. Yeah. And Ellen Kazame does something similar too with mathematics education. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a resource from Teaching Works, University of Michigan, where they talk about having student teachers rehearse for each other the ways they will be going through their teaching and the advantages to that um, for their student teaching. And in the last, this last year in particular, the year before I started doing this as well, in my pre-conferences with my student teachers, um, instead of them just telling me what they're doing in their lessons, we have other conversations as well in that pre-conference, we also, I have them do a mental, or actually a, a talk aloud, a mental rehearsal. They tell me what they're doing through the course of their teaching. And I'm, I was surprised when I first started doing this that the student teachers would start getting to the places where they hadn't thought something through. And this rehearsal process some, is something we might think about in the future. It's a way of developing practice, setting students up to do well in their, in their teaching. Another um, push I'm gonna set out there is just thinking about assessments. And this may be a little um, problematic for us, but we'll think about this. Um, I have my own philosophy of teaching, what matters in teaching. One of the things I believe about in teaching is that if you own the assessments, if you own the expectations for the learning and you set them out for students, then you've got the whole process because the assessment tells you about your teaching and you get better at teaching. 
one of the concerns I have is too much, this is my take, so this, this is Johnny, how much of what matters to our student teachers learning is measured by someone else in a different way that doesn't, isn't central to what we do. So what I'm suggesting to us is, how do we start owning the assessment part of our work as well? Instead of thinking about, well, they're gonna get a test score from Pearson that says they're good teachers and not good teachers. Well, you know, if back, go back to your own classroom. Can you imagine you were doing some great teaching of whatever you were doing in math or science or language arts, and then somebody else came in and said, this will be the assessment for what you're doing. So let's think about that as a piece. Um, and I'm pushing on an abolitionist perspective on this too, because testing does things about race and class and all those other things that we need to be considering as well. So I think I have just one more. Yeah, this will be the last one. Um, the last one I want to throw out there, and this, I'm using this term, the long conversation. I used it yesterday as well. Just about our relationship with our student teachers. Um, I've done this for a number of years, and I've moved away from this. It's a struggle sometimes. But my question for us is, how do we move from a focus on, focus on instances of teaching, okay? The observations and the forms they fill out and the reflection form and, and all those bits and pieces that count. And this came up um, in Esther's um, presentation earlier today too, to a holistic lived consideration of teaching, all the things that matter. And it's interesting to me because in my work with student teaching, all those other things that matter, they come up in our conversations all the time, but they're not the stuff that counts. So how do we include that as well? So my question for us is how do we create the long conversation in our mentoring? How do we form a constant formative relationship with our student teachers that involves giving direction, feedback, self-assessment, and reflection, not just for them, because all that activity informs us about our mentoring, about our work as teachers, the kinds of things we care to do. And as I did yesterday, I shared our interactive supervision journal. This is another artifact from our work where in the spring, when we were trying to figure out what to do with supervision, I just met with my student teachers each for like an hour where they just set out for me, this was choice, they set out for me the activities they were doing. And they represented for themselves and for me what they were doing in their teaching, what they were getting out of it. And my work was to lead an instructional conversation that kept going from week to week to week so we had a picture of their development over time. So I laid out a bunch of stuff to think about um, we're going to come back later in the session to um, talk about, think about some things for ourselves. And I'm really happy that I get to work with Jane today. Jane, I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide. And Jane's going to talk to, she'll let you know what she's going to talk about. And Jane, you just let me know when you want me to change the slides, okay? That'll be great. Thank you, Johnny. I appreciate your talk. Johnny and I have had multiple conversations around reimagining field. Uh, and supervision uh, since both of us are on the Ceterin grant. And one of the things that Johnny has always brought up at almost every single meeting has been about um, looking beyond the T T uh, TPEs and looking beyond the CTC requirements and really centering supervision and field work around the needs of educators and the needs of K-12 students. And those don't always align with what the CTC may require or ask of our uh, student teachers. Um, I want to say that um, Johnny uses the word cooperating teacher. I'll probably use the word mentor or guiding teacher, but when we say that we're talking about the teacher in the classroom that our pre-service teachers um, work with um, in the schools. So, um, one of the things that we do at UCLA, and by the way, I want to uh, let everyone know that this is not my work. This is the work of TEP faculty that have put this in place long before I showed up in the program. Uh, but I wanted to share the work that the UCLA TEP faculty has done to really uh, make field placements intentional in transforming the schools and communities. Um, so uh, one of the readings that our, we ask our pre-service teachers to uh, read is, uh, is a mural um, article 
uh, there is a growing consens consensus that teacher preparation, if it is to meet the needs of an increasingly culturally and linguistically diverse school population in America, will require collaboration among schools of education, arts and sciences faculty, and higher education. And this is where I want to highlight the importance is the community stakeholders, parents, and school personnel to prepare multicultural, multi, multiculturally competent teachers. And I think as teacher education programs, we tend to think the work belongs in, in higher ed, uh, but, we, but our TEP program has really looked at reimagining field and field supervision through the community, through the parents, through the schools. Um, and saying that uh, for the next slide, Johnny, thank you. Um, these are some of the things that we do in our program that's intentional placement. Um, faculty advisors do the field placements. From what I understand, not all TEP programs um, have the faculty do the placements, but in our program, the individual advisors of the cohorts of pre-service teachers uh, place, match, and place um, pre-service student teachers into uh, the schools. Um, the intent is to group them in three plus in a school. So uh, we try to prevent singleton, although that may happen, that is not, the intention is to group them in a school. Uh, faculty advisors, professors of the program, uh, graduate students, and um, are what some of the supervisors in the field. Um, because of that, uh, supervisors are really encouraged and required to understand the school's culture and community and not just visit for that moment at this one school and then move on to the next school. There is an engagement that occurs on a regular ongoing basis that immerses the supervisor into the, into the schools as well. Um, schools are selected based on concentration of alumni from our program and relationships with principals. So we try to have our mentor teachers have the same philosophy, social justice, pedagogy, and um, the same um, ideology or philosophy of education. And so our mentor teachers tend to be alumni from the program. Um, our principals often have a relationship with us and some of them have even gone through the Principal Leadership Institute through UCLA. And so they have a shared vision for um, transforming their schools and community. Johnny, next slide. So forming relationships and transforming communities. So oh, there are three parts to this. So one is a strong social justice commitment to students and community. Um, building capacity at the school with alumni and TEP network. So the more teachers we have that are from our TEP program, the more power or empower they are in making um, real systematic and uh, changes within the school. And then uh, thirdly, engaging in community work as community teachers. Um, this piece is actually not tied into the CTC requirement. So uh, doing community work might not count towards the 600 uh, hours required of our teachers, but it does count towards the coursework they take with us in our, in our program. So for example, um, this, we have a project called the Community Inquiry Project, which is also known as the CIP. And in this qualitative ethnographic research project, students do to, uh, together in groups, uh, they do this project based on their school site. So it, it, that is why it's also important that they be in groups at school sites. Uh, the school sites typically are in South LA, Central LA or East LA where there's a high concentration of need. Um, the CIP project requires our students to look at the impact of, for example, parent centers, health centers, and other community-based educational resources. Um, later on, they use that knowledge to link their project-based learning or problem-based learning PBL projects uh, to these community resources. Um, the intent of these uh, projects are actually to help deepen the understanding of the school and the community and the culture. 
and um, it's a ethnographic practice that helps them become insiders in a school community rather than outsiders observing from afar. Um, Johnny, next slide. And um, I, uh, we have two criteria for how a school meets the needs of our, um, what we uh, define as UCLA. So um, underserved, which means under-resourced, hardest staff, uh, community communities of color, such as demographic information um, defined by race, ethnicity, uh, emergent bilingual Eng English language learners, foster youth, um, homeless youth um, data. We also look at low income. Is it Title I? Does it offer free, uh, what population percentage of the student population um, receives free or reduced lunch? And then academic need. And the next slide. That the next slide is our second criteria for placement. Um, we look specifically, obviously, uh, as you may know, LA is really large and it has pockets of of um, of affluent schools, and then it has pockets of not so affluent schools. So we do concentrate in certain areas within this boundary, and this also helps them to then when they look for jobs once they re receive their preliminary credential. Our hope is that those same schools that they were at or in the same communities that they then find teaching positions there and have the experience, a full year experience of understanding and being immersed in the culture and community of that neighborhood or school. And so this is the intention of keeping them in certain areas um, and to build that capacity. And the next slide. Um, one of the things that um, that um, Tyrone Howard uh, speaks about is the effectiveness effectiveness of teachers. And this is another reading that we do with our first year teachers is um, from Hearing Foot Footsteps in the Dark. Um, and it's uh, he talks about how. Um, the practices of uh, teacher effectiveness is based on their how they mirror their classrooms in with family and community practices, beliefs, and values. Um, and as a, a student had said, uh, make schools seem like home. And in order for schools to feel like home, teachers must acknowledge and immerse themselves in the community and culture. So hence, we really believe and value the community educator model of placing them. Um, in these clusters. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Johnny and Jane, for the presentation. I've noticed in the chat some discussion about the missing standards, and I think that was really resonated with what you were talking about, being sure that it centers your supervision um, in not just what's asked for in the TPEs, for example. So we're going to be dividing you up into um, uh, breakout rooms and in the breakout rooms you'll be um, you'll have a, a document that I've just linked in the chat that will ask you to reflect on uh, the conversation and your own ideas about reimagining supervision and then we're going to come back together to have a whole group discussion okay well it looks like uh, everyone is back um, from the conversations um, Johnny and Jane, would you like to ask or answer any questions that you see on the document or would somebody like to get the discussion started? We have about seven minutes. The only thing I wanted to uh, say is thank you for um, filling in the document. Johnny and I mm -hmm. wanted all of us to contribute to, uh, the, to your knowledge and all that you have experienced um, as supervisors. And so um, honestly, I'm not sure if I could even answer these questions, but I would love to hear more from, from the audience as well. I, I, anybody want to offer any questions? I just want to say, I appreciated my group. Um, something that I, I'm going to say here, we said it together, is that we might think about a session in a month or two where it's absolutely focused on supervision, like what to do now. And we may, we all may be smarter in two months, and that might be something we do. 
I'll bring something up just because our group was talking about something you you raised, Johnny, which is this instead of focusing on these discrete moments in time and this lesson or that observation, mm -hmm. looking at the bigger mm -hmm. thing, how you teach and and um, you know those bigger, more important questions. And we we somebody mentioned the example that was shared this morning in Rita's talk of the teacher who was feeling very disenfranchised and marginalized in her school. So that's like, when would that conversation, you know, how do we, how do we make sure we're, we're um, addressing those bigger issues or conversations? So I'm curious to hear, hear your ideas. Well, um, I'm, I'll just put something out there. I'm being philosophical again, that this, this notion of, I keep coming back to teaching because I'm a teacher going into my supervision. And sometimes folks talk about teaching as an art, and sometimes teaching as a science. Well, there's both to it. And there's points at which is, if it's an art, you have to step back and get the whole of it. But then as a science, there are the particulars. So it's, I'm not against TPEs or TPAs or whatever, but they're frames for us to think about the pieces that matter, but we have to understand why they matter to each other and, and understand that teaching is a human endeavor. It's not a bunch of pieces of things. So that's why I keep coming back to the holistic piece. And I know it's philosophical, and I know making it work is is something to discuss. But in all of our teaching, I know that you know, if we were just, you know, I hope we're mostly beyond this prescribed scripted curriculum. We know how deficit that is, and how, what we miss in students, and you know, how do we avoid that for our own self instead of going through a checklist of TPEs or whatever? What 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 are the things we should be looking for in the teachers that we're working with? I don't know. I, Hope that helps a little bit, Lisa. I, I, I can thank you. It's wonderful. I like hearing the words around that. Welcome, Eva. Thank you. I was just going to say I appreciate thinking about it as a science and an art, and I think that uh, you know at UCLA we talk a lot about theory and practice, and I think um, I won't speak for all of my colleagues, but I have sometimes gotten the criticism from our students that. Um, we actually spend a lot of time on identity. We spend a lot of time on talking about the all the isms and the challenges. And then our students feel like, um, I need practices. I need the things that I can do in the classroom. So it's really important to have that balance. Um, we want to make sure that we're equipping them so that they can be effective, so that they can actually navigate this system, which we know how it operates. So, you know, kind of like Lisa Delpit says, we want to have that balance of skills because the system has not yet changed to the ideal. Um, but we also want to equip them with um, the theory and um, the supportive environment where they can explore the challenges that they're experiencing. So I, you got to do both. Otherwise, you fall on the other side of the, uh, the criticisms that I feel like I often experience. I'm just going to thank you, Melissa, for that. Just the idea that there's, teaching is a skilled profession. And that when I brought up the whole notion of communities of practice, it means that there is a practice that takes expertise. And that's our work, is to help develop that expertise or work, for, work with student beginning teachers to approach and move towards the kinds of expertise we have with our cooperating teachers. And I see it as the continuum that at the front end, we're moving them towards that. So what's our work at the front end to make sure they can move towards that expertise? And it takes theory, it takes practice, it takes the art and the science of the work we do. One of the things I appreciated, Johnny, bringing up is the um, intersection of the UDL framework. And it seems to me as we're infusing UDL in the way that we are instructing and supporting candidates for them to part of their transition needs to go from Evelyn you had mentioned this earlier going from becoming students in our program to becoming teachers in our program that transformation and part of that is in, in embodying them and empowering them as expert learners to help them develop the expert learners that they're going to be support supporting so I just want to add to that, Laura, because you took me to a meta moment too, which is as much as our we have these expectations for our student teachers to make sense of their teaching, we have that same expertise. So when I'm sharing about UDL, 
I'm thinking four years ago when people are proposing UDL to me and this is gonna be part of my curriculum in my seminars and I'm going, I don't know much about this. So here I am the learner as the teacher at the same time and how, how that's a position we have to assume for ourselves too, that we can't start from being the expert always we have to understand our need to learn and work. And, and the last piece is, if we're teaching them these things that we value, how are we embodying them in our own teaching of them? Which is a, is a challenge sometimes, because I'm, you know, I'm thinking about race consciousness, I'm thinking about um, differences in learning, I'm think, thinking about all these things that we're valuing and suggesting to our student teachers they should carry into their practice. How am I carrying it into my own practice and my work with them? So. Sorry to put such a burden on you all. No, it's the beginner's mindset. My yoga teacher refers to that. Going back to the beginner's mindset always. Thank you for that, Laura. Well, and, and that seems like a really uh, a perfect note on which to end. But again, thank you to Jane and Johnny, to all thank of you for sharing your ideas. I know. Thank you, Jane. Hey, everyone. Thank, you. thank you. Bye. Thank you.